how I love you, Cado, Cado.
Father, we love Thank you, Jesus. We declare the reign of our King tonight. Our God is worthy. Is worthy to receive all glory and honor. Father, we love. Father, we love. Oh, how we love you, Jesus. So simple. Good morning and wonderful to be able to reach you again this morning. We thank God for the opportunity that we have. And even in the situation that we are in, we can still reach you, share God's word, and allow you to have some form of fellowship in your home as you listen to the message that we have. By God's grace, uh, we have come into a new month and he has been faithful to us. We are trusting him. And very soon, for those of us in the uh, in Ekwa Sokoro who attend church there, uh, by God's grace, this month will not end without us coming together and meeting in fellowship. Keep praying for the work, keep praying for the building, and as the Lord leads you, we ask that you give in support of that work that is going on very well to the glory and honor of God Almighty. Today is the last Sunday of the Youth Fellowship International Week of Prayer. And we're going to look at that, uh, something that will talk to our young people, but not only to our young people, to all of us who have tuned in this morning to listen to the message that the Lord has placed in my heart for you and for those who are close to you that I believe you will share. If you're on Facebook, like we are, where we are broadcasting, please start a watch party. Invite friends who may be at home for some reason they didn't go to church. Uh, let them have something to listen to instead of just maybe while in a way time and doing things that may not be very good. So start a watch party. Invite someone and put your comments there. You, as God blesses you, you'll be very happy to see them. And um, all the details that you will need will be scrolling under your screen. May you please use them to honor God. Let's pray together this morning again. Father, we come in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your faithfulness and your love. We thank you for how you've kept us again. It's a new month and you have been faithful. We are the ones who have days. We are the ones who have time. You live in eternity. You've given us days and time so that we can 
calculate them and use them and be, make valuable our time, even as we walk with you. So we thank you for bringing us into this new month of August. We thank you for how you've kept us. Uh, the year has not really gone like many of us would have wished, but your faithfulness has not changed, even though the circumstances around us have changed. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for today, which is celebrated across Equa, around the world, as the International Day for the Youth Fellowship. And we thank you for the young people that we have around us. We thank you for their lives. We ask your blessing upon them. We ask, oh God, especially for those who are trusting you for one thing or the other, some for jobs, some for marriage, some for business, whatever it is they're looking up to you for, eternal God in heaven, let them enjoy your favor in a special way. We pray, oh God, for those who have something that they're doing, they have most of the things they've asked you for answered. Father, keep them faithful to you. Above all, we ask, oh God, that all of them would walk faithfully with God Almighty. We pray for those who are in the church, but yet they don't know you as Lord and Savior. Open their eyes, oh Heavenly Father, to see the reality of having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and walking faithfully with him. Lord, we pray that you would help us, that as we share from your word this morning what you've laid in my heart, I pray, oh eternal God in heaven, that your spirit will speak to your people, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, there will be conviction, there will be, there will be learning, there will be encouragement, and uh, there will be some strong impactation of your word in the life of all who are listening this morning. Eternal Father, do beyond our expectation, O oh Lord, with your word according to the promise that you've given to us, that, Lord, you will do beyond what we can ask or ever imagine. Do that for us today, that we'll have testimonies to the glory of your holy and majestic name. I ask, O oh God, that your name will be honored again. Lord, you said that we lift up your name, you will draw some to yourself for different diverse reasons people are listening today may they come close to the foot of the cross that they might find help in their place of need thank you our father and let all your name be glorified now i pray oh god for some who are sick some are even sick spiritually they are discouraged they are they are they are at the brink of depression they may be as sad and sorrowful let your word do something significantly new in their lives i pray for those oh lord who are just discouraged with life things are difficult for them especially our young people oh god in heaven let your word do something significant and give them direction and help them that there will be a testimony of a turnaround in someone's life today because of the word that you will give Take all the glory, eternal God, in Jesus' victorious, mighty name we have prayed. Amen and amen. And so today we go back to the book of the beginning, Genesis. My Bible is open to Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. And in Genesis chapter 39, I'll read from verse 1 to verse 10. Genesis chapter 39, verse 1 to verse 10. 10. I'm reading today from the New Living Translation. It kind of picture brings a good picture of the thoughts that uh, we want to consider this morning. So Genesis chapter 39, reading from verse 1. Now when Joseph arrived in Egypt with the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, a member of the personal staff of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Potiphar was the captain of the palace guard. The Lord was with Joseph and blessed him greatly as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. So Joseph naturally became quite a, quite a favorite with him. Potiphar soon put Joseph in charge of his entire household and entrusted him with all his business dealings. From the day Joseph was put in charge, the Lord began to bless Potiphar for Joseph's sake. All his household affairs began to run smoothly, and his crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't have a, have a worry in the world except to decide what he wanted to eat. Now Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man, verse 7. About this, about this time, Potiphar's wife began to desire him and invited him to see her. Joseph refused. Look, told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How could I ever do such a wicked thing? 
a great sin to God. God had blessings, reading of his majestic word, his powerful word. This morning, from this passage we have read, Genesis chapter 39, I want to bring to you a message that I've titled, Managing Change. Managing Change. Ability for us to manage change. When things don't go the way we want to things begin to change. I want to share with you some thoughts from this passage, how we can manage change. I share these thoughts because we all today are experiencing changes in almost every sphere of our lives. We now have a new narrative, which is the new normal, suggesting that certain things that we did, that we did not see as normal, are becoming our new way of life. How do we for those of us who are young people, there's a long future by the grace of God ahead of you. Things will change. We will come through this. A new way of life will be will, 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 is, is already upon us. Things will keep changing. How do we manage this continuous circle that we are sure will continue to happen? Nothing they say is permanent except change. And though we know that nothing is permanent except change, but in many quarters, it appears that nothing is more resisted than change. But yes, we know that nothing is permanent except change, but yet nothing appears to be more resisted than change. So we say nothing is permanent except change. When change is before us, there is resistance to change. It yet change part of us. We have resisted and it has changed. We have resisted and it has changed. Struggling with this time after time yet we haven't gotten used to the fact that nothing is permanent except change. How do we now manage change is what I want to talk to you about. Let me tell you a few things that would cause change to take place. That as you live through life, you would be sure that one of these three, there may be many but I've put these three together would come your way, and when they come, they would bring changes to situations, changes to your life, changes to the way you do things. Number one is self-motivated change. By self-motivated change, I mean when you decide that you want to change, having researched the new and found it better, or you just are tired, and what you have, you have decided that you want to pursue a new way of doing that is on your own, you decide. It's okay doing things this way. I want to change. You've checked out certain options and you've decided the option to take. It's your own volition. You are not under any pressure. It's just you getting to a point where you feel that, hey, I think I need to do something different. I think I need to change jobs. I think I need to change business. I think I need to change my car. I think I need to change the way I approach life. And on your own, you self-motivate yourself and encourage yourself to do things differently. That self-motivated change would occur in some, for some of us. And some of you have already experienced that as life went on, you got tired of something, you got tired of using something and you decided to change. You got tired of using one product and changed to another product. You did it on your own. Some research, you got advice and you accepted to do that. Self-motivated change will always will happen to some of us. The second thing that will bring change is change brought about by circumstances. Some within your control and some out of your control. Certain things around you kind of force you to change. Some improvement in life, some improvement in an equipment. You don't really want to, but the circumstances put you in a spot where you have to change. A new idea comes in. Competitors and competition comes in. And you know that to survive in the terrain where you are, you need to change. You don't want to, but the circumstances around you get you to the place where you need to change. In fact, the weather makes you to change certain things. Your dressing changes with the weather sometimes. You don't want to. You like this weather, but the weather will keep changing. And just the natural thing that God has said forces you to change. Change the way you build. Change the way you even decorate your home. So all of those things come. And every change, let me, let's, let's be sure, every change affects us in different ways. The third thing that would bring about change is change 
change that is unplanned for, change that is forced. So first of all, we see the first self-motivated change. We see change brought about by circumstances. And then thirdly, change that is unplanned for, change that we are forced to take, to, to, to go through. When things outside your own control make you change, there's a sudden sack or reduction in your place of work. Your life takes a new trajectory because they you, you, you didn't expect it and they gave you a letter on the day you arrived and said your services are no more required there's death that occurs that happens and somebody who is taking care of you who is sponsoring you passes on your life takes a new direction those kind of changes you you you, you don't plan for them and they come they are forced upon you as it were there's a turn in the market so that favor the market begins to go down and things begin to slump and your shares begin to drop because certain things have happened and the value of what you have is, is eroding in front of you and there's really nothing you can do. Those changes have a way also of affecting us. Today, our lives are changing because of a pandemic. None of us planned it. None of us wanted it. None of us was really prepared for it. But we are here facing this example of change that is unplanned for. I don't know which one you are in. Is it the one that you took yourself of course, sometimes we do that. So some of us will find that as we go through life, we would go through these three change patterns and they would have a way of affecting how we do things. But one thing I want to tell you, whatever pattern comes your way, for you to go through it, come out better on the other side, come out happy on the other side, your attitude towards change is important. So what's your attitude towards change? What's your attitude to the fact that there's a turnaround in things? What's your attitude to... to to the fact that things are not going the way you wanted them to go. Are you on the optimistic side knowing that Romans 8.28 says that in all things it still works together for the good to them that love God. There must be an attitude that gives you stability. An attitude that keeps you going. Or are you one of those who have thrown up a pity party? You are mourning, complaining, grumbling. And the circumstances you don't have the capacity to change. Your attitude is critical if you are going to manage change. My dear young person that I come to more this morning, I ask you, what's your attitude when things change? Are you set in your ways and if they don't go the way you want them to go, you're not ready to move? That's not going to help you move ahead in life. You need to be able to have an attitude to know that change will come in life. Change is part of us and our ability to accept and move on with change that is positive and good is very important to make you better and make you even serve God better. So the attitude is critical. And when all these three changes will come around, now back to our text, we see Joseph in a very precarious situation. The situation was difficult for Joseph because everything was happening for him so fast as it were. And life took a new dimension. Life was changing. He didn't expect this change. He didn't expect those who brought about this change to be the people to bring about this change. It could have been better if maybe we say he was even kidnapped like we experience very sadly in our world today and then it was not his brothers that did this to him you can imagine what's going on in Joseph's mind you can imagine what he's thinking at how, how, how could they have done this to me just because I had a dream I may not have managed to tell him the dream well but that I, I had a dream I didn't force myself to dream and yet his brothers decided that they were going to do this to him Joseph found himself in a place that he never expected. His life had changed. His dreams had changed. Even if he believed in his dreams, the circumstances around him didn't point to the fact that, that those dreams were going to come true. Joseph found himself in a place where he needed to manage the change in his life. And as he was going through this, Joseph teaches us certain lessons. Number one lesson that Joseph teaches us as we see in our text is that you have to adapt to the new and work at understanding the new. Adapt to the new and work at understanding the new. Look with me in the first four verses of our text. It says when Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. He was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian 
uh, officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. I like the text because it tells us who Potiphar was. It tells us what Potiphar did. It tells us the position Potiphar held and tells us very clearly that Joseph had left his Jewish roots to a, a new location. Joseph had moved now. He was a foreigner. He was in a new land. He went there not as a king, not as one with influence, but he went there as a slave. He went there as someone who was going to serve and he didn't know maybe what the future would hold. Joseph was in a new culture. Life took a new dimension. The Bible tells us in verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph. So he succeeded. We'll talk about that in a bit. So he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar. So he soon made Joseph his personal attention. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. Everything was brand new for Joseph. But you can sense Joseph adapting to what was happening as he did what he could and was not complaining for there's no record in scripture that Joseph was complaining. He was there and God helped him to do well. God will help those who, have re who are ready to look at what is going on. The attitude that they present, if they go grumbling, God God will have to help them understand that no, I'm still with you even though you got to a situation that you didn't expect to get to. But how, what attitude do you go with? You can sense Joseph doing his best. You can sense Joseph, maybe in his heart he was not happy, but yet Joseph kept doing his best so that the people around him could observe that there's something about this guy that was different. When this kind of situation took place, look at what he says. One would have thought that he would have been sad but this is what the bible says that the notice that the lord was with joseph giving him success in everything he did everything he did connotes that he engaged himself in something that was available to be done he got himself busy he didn't sit down throwing a pity party there's no time for a pity party it has happened it has happened get yourself together get yourself together get the things that you can get put yourself together and do what you can do in the situation that you are in because the Lord God of heaven has not abandoned you. There was no place for grumbling. We don't hear any grumbling from Joseph. Joseph put himself together. Maybe in his heart he was asking God why but on his duty post he was effective. On his duty post he was doing his best. On his duty post Joseph made sure that he did the best he could do. The Bible says that he was successful in everything as he served in the home of of his Egyptian master as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. No grumbling, no unnecessary complaining, no unnecessary complaining. Do the best that you can. I don't know the situation you are in. Grumbling will not change it. Being effective will help you be better and be happier. Grumbling will not change it. Complaining about who did what and who didn't do what and who should have done and who didn't do and who shouldn't have done and who got you in. That's not going to help you, dear one. It is using the situation you are in and seeing the best that you can from the situation. Like they always say that in every crisis, there are people who find opportunities. There are people who have found opportunity in this situation, dear young one. And they're not complaining, oh, we can't be in normal school. They've gone online. They've learned more than they would have learned if they were in their normal school because you have the opportunity to even do some training that is free and you could be certified. You can pay for some of those training. There's something that could be done if you're ready. But if you sit down and throw a pity party, oh, there's so much pain and trouble and everything. In the situation you are in, do the best you can. God is in the business of still moving you, seeing what you have done to be and do something better. Amen. So God is telling us through Joseph here, adapt to the new. The new situation has come. Adapt to it. Understand what it is. Find out as much as you can. And this is the challenge that we are facing. There are a lot of people that are not ready to adapt to what has happened to us and find out what exactly are we passing through. So many theories and are coming and we can save from all of it what is going on. And sadly, if you follow them, the minority 
see more noise in that the majority because places where they've made themselves to try and understand what is going on and face this squarely are doing great things. Brothers and sisters and their friends, my dear young people, you still have the opportunity. Understand the situation change has brought you. You've lost your job. Understand that that job that you used to enjoy, the things that came with the job, they are gone. There's a new reality now. It may not be the same, but be the best you can in that new reality. There's a new reality now. It's not the same. You've changed jobs from one to another. You've changed school. Life has changed situations around you. Adapt to what has happened. A loved one has passed on. You're weeping. Yes, it shows your love and your concern, but it's not going to bring the person back. You need to get your life together. Put yourself together. Face the challenge before you and see God walk with you. Adapt to it. Understand that this is my new position now. In this new position, what can I do? Where can I go? Who can I talk to? Where can I get help? Who are the people who are there? Because you will never be the first. Somebody had gone ahead of you and now you can learn from those ones and there's opportunity to learn if you want to understand the change that has occurred. Joseph was found, found successful in everything that he did. Joseph adapted and worked at understanding the situation. The next thing I want to share with you in trying to manage change, that apart from adapting and understanding the situation, I'm going to tell you three things and I want to put, I'll put all of them together as my second thought for you this morning. This is that you have to unlearn, learn, and relearn. Let me say that again. That apart from adapting and understanding, you have to unlearn, that is, unlearn some things, you have to learn some things, and you have to relearn certain things. Look at this passage, if you may, picking at verse 5. It says, From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. Look at this. All his household affairs ran smoothly, and his crop and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything that he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. Not verse 5. All his household affairs ran smoothly and his crops and livestock flourished. Joseph came from a shepherd's background. Joseph came from a background that he was a shepherd boy but he was he really practicing being a shepherd. The only place we, he will read where Joseph goes to see his brothers was that he takes food to them. He was not with the flock but he took food to them. So he saw what they did but because of love, joke Jacob his father had for him Joseph didn't we don't have any record that Joseph went out to be with them maybe he went once in a while but his older brothers would have had more experience maybe he went once in a while but his older brothers went more of the time so all he did was to take food so Joseph was not completely gone in his understanding and his, his, his experience Joseph was definitely not running the affairs of the house because he had older brothers he had his his, his his father he had his his mother apart from his mother you remember that there were four women in the life of Jacob so Joseph really had no business running the house but Joseph had to unlearn how to now be in charge of a home that is a different culture, in a different society, not too much of shepherding now, but a different home scenario. He had to unlearn those things. Joseph had to learn now how to live in this situation, how to understand the things, how to understand how they relate and understand how they did things. They may have some things that are similar, but he had to learn. Joseph had to relearn some of the things he knew, but new patterns had come. He sure needed to unlearn some things things coming from his background. He needed to learn new things because of his situation. He needed to learn and, 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 and relearn certain things based on the new responsibilities that he had. So as you go on in life, the background that you come from will affect the place that you are. Yes, came from a place in work. You came from a culture that had certain things and you come to a new place. You need to calm down and relearn. You need to click, come back and learn again. You need to unlearn as it were. There's a new way to get it done. Don't let the old way keep you stuck. Unlearn those old ways. Those old ways will keep you stuck. Meanwhile, there's a new way. If Joseph said, no, in my place, this is how it is done. He may not have found the kind of success that he had. 
God. If Joseph said, no, in the place I used to walk before, this is how it is done. Every new place has the way they do their things, the way they, 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 they run. They have a culture. They have a tradition of how things are done. And you need to unlearn from where you're coming from and relearn. And so you need to unlearn because there's a new way to do things. There are new equipments. There are new methods. You need to learn them. Oh, yes, you were good, but new equipments have come. Learn how to use those equipments. You need to learn the new methods that have come to improve you. Once upon a time, the architects would take their pencils and draw. Today, they sit on the computer and they give you fantastic drawings. Once upon a time, we, we didn't have all the equipments that we have. You can stay stuck in the old equipments. New equipments will have come. And so, therefore, you need to learn what you are used to has improved. Relearn. The mobile phone is a good example. When we started, we didn't have all the facilities that the phones of today have. Some people are still stuck with only those facilities of texts and calls. But you need to relearn that the basic thing is to send communication, but we have improved the way we send communication so that we can face do FaceTime on some kind of on some handsets. We can chat and see ourselves. We can send WhatsApp messages and we can send different kind of messages. We can send pictures. We can we can play around with the pictures and, and do a lot of things and still send the message. You need to relearn the use of the phone. It's still the phone, but it's now our phone with more facilities. That's how life is. There are places where you go to, new ideas have come, new improvements have come, and you stay stuck to the old one. And that's why they say you are old-fashioned. You need to relearn what you know so that it brings you up to speed because change has occurred. You need to learn new methods. New equipments have come. Improved equipments have come in your field. You, you, you don't need certain things now. If you're doing certain things, there are new equipments that have come that makes the work easier. Don't stay stuck in the hard old way. Learn the new way that makes it easier. And if you're going to manage change, there's a new way. In our lives, there will be new ways. Young man, young woman, be able to learn, be able to unlearn, be able to relearn, be able to do these things to keep you going. Two things become very important. Two things that hold us back in learning, relearning, and unlearning. Two things. Number one is practice. Practice. Let me tell you something that I'm sure you know, but I'll give you another side to it that I heard somebody say. We all know that they say that practice makes perfect. True, but practice also makes permanent. And the danger is when we keep practicing and it becomes permanent, it becomes difficult to change. It becomes difficult to relearn because practice has made it perfect. Yes, but practice has made it permanent. And when made permanent, it becomes difficult. So practice should make perfect to the degree that you are willing to change and practice the new. Let me take that again. Practice should make perfect to the degree that you are willing to change and practice the new. Some of you now have to practice how to walk from home. That's a new one for all of us. You need to practice that. But if you are used to going to an office, staying in the office space, you need to change. You need to change. That's the new situation we're in. Some of you, our cars are good examples. Yes, you've practiced how to drive and many people knew how to drive with the manual gear. And the time came when the automatic came. I know people who resisted. In fact, I met somebody who actually said that they're not going to buy automatic exterior and gear, gear, gear shift and they said why he said that the automatic is for people who have physical challenge with their legs that's for those kind of people and so they don't want to change why the new methods have come practice has made perfect they enjoyed the shift and everything and the new one came it became a practice practice makes perfect but practice also makes permanent and when you do that it becomes difficult to learn unlearn and relearn and so therefore I, I tell you practice should make perfect to the degree that you are willing to change and practice the new the next thing that will hinder us from getting progress in managing our change apart from practice is what uh, uh, the, 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 he, he's a Christian historian and, and, and a very interesting man his name is Joras Love Pelican. I need to tell you his name because of what I'm going to tell you. It is called traditionalism. Traditionalism. If you've 
known me for some time, I've said this before, it's called traditionalism. Two things that would hinder you to learn, unlearn, and relearn. One is practice, because practice makes perfect, but practice also makes permanent. And when it becomes permanent, it becomes difficult. That's why somebody said for people to change, you have to tell them something seven times before they would accept what you're saying. You can imagine how long that is for general, for most people. Traditionalism, tradition, trying to define it. Joris Love says, tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Tradition is the living faith of the dead, the things that they did and left for us so we can look at the past and learn and move forward. But the danger is traditionalism, which is the dead faith of the living, that they are alive but nothing new. They are just in the same circle. Nothing is changing. And this is what he says. So let me read the whole thing. It says, tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. And I suppose, he goes on to say, I should add that it is traditionalism that gives gives tradition a bad name. Traditionalism gives tradition a bad name. This is how it has been done. This is how our fathers did it. How can we improve the wheel? We're not reinventing the wheel. We're improving the wheel. Traditionalism holds us in the place where tradition has brought us. And instead of helping us move on so that we leave a new tradition for the next generation, we are stuck in that place. And it doesn't allow you to move. And this is a challenge that we have. And this challenge does not allow us to learn and relearn. We are comfortable with what we know. Practice has become perfect. Traditionalism now gives tradition a bad name. And so the good qualities of our tradition, the good qualities of the establishment you're in, the good qualities of the practices that you have are eroded because we are stuck and not ready to move. And many have suffered. If you read books about about people and companies, a good book to read is a, a book written by a man named Jim Collins. The title of the book is Good to Great. And if you read that book, he took companies over the years that have been doing well. In our very lifetime, many of us will know that the Nokia company was the leading phone manufacturing company in the world when telecommunications hit the market. And they were making a lot of phones and everybody wanted a Nokia. They were durable, they were good. But then the Android application came. And when the Android came, they didn't want to shift. They were sold out of the market. Today, they are struggling to bring themselves back into the market. They stuck to tradition, and they stayed on tradition. Traditionalism came and destroyed them. They were used to the old, the dead faith of the founding fathers, the dead faith of the immediate, the visionaries. And yes, that was good, but traditionalism kept them from innovating and coming up to catch up what was going on. Where, where today are the blackberries? What happened to the blackberry? Almost the same story. Where today are the blackberries? Blackberries. Once upon a time in this part of the world, if you had a blackberry, and in many parts of the world also, it was a thing of class. That has passed. But look at the story of the iPhone. With every new innovation, they're improving. They've not stayed where the founding fathers started. They've moved on. Traditionalism has not caught up with them. Let your life be one that sticks to certain things that I will tell you which is the next point. And then you will see that you'll be able to manage change. Practice is good, but practice is good to the degree that you don't allow it to become permanent and stop you from changing. Traditionalism, which is the dead faith of the living, you are alive, nothing new, you are alive, you stick to what it is, and you don't allow air, as it were, to come in to the system and bring some change. Joseph allowed, didn't allow himself to stay in that old practice that he was staying in. He allowed himself to learn new things. He must have allowed himself not to, to know know where he came from, but know where he was, to know where he was so that he can keep moving in the direction that God was leading him. And that the third thing I'll share with you is that apart from the fact that you must learn, you must unlearn, you must learn and you must relearn, is the fact that you must embrace the new, but be solid on your beliefs. A new situation had come into Joseph's life. A new whole story had come. But you'll notice that if you have followed me so far, you'll notice that Joseph must have allowed himself a certain liberty to get into the new that he was and was adjusting well and was doing well, but he needed to be solid on his beliefs. He needed to be strong on his beliefs. Read with me, if you may, the closing part of verse 6 into verse 7 and then verse 8. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. 
Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. And Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded, but Joseph refused. I want you to underscore those words that I, I'm reading from New Living Translation. Joseph refused. Other translations almost say the same thing, but Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? Now, this is the point. It would be a great sin against God. Joseph knew certain things were wrong because he was strained from home. He had a belief in a God that knew and told his fathers what to do when he comes to this kind of situation. And Joseph embraced the new situation, was functioning in his new place, had changed his view, was walking, had doing what he could do. But Joseph stood solid on the beliefs that he had. He stood solid on the principles that he had received. And this is where we come in as children of God. The world is changing, but the message that we carry, the gospel of truth that are recorded in this Bible will remain the same. The, the, the modalities to carry it out will change. Today I'm reaching to you. You don't see you. I can't see you, but you can see me. And I'm reaching more people as it were than maybe I would have been able to reach if we were in one building and not having cameras and all the things that I'm using. So we're still carrying the same message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that gives life, but we are living in a changing world by using cameras. Once upon a time, we didn't use cameras. Once upon a time, we didn't have all those things. We're using cameras. Some of us have not seen some of the great preachers that we know in real life, but technology has made it possible for us to see. Many of us have read books written by the man, the great evangelist who has passed on, Billy Graham. We've never seen him face to face, but we've seen his picture. We watch and listen to his messages. And so technology has come. He embraced the new, but he was solid on his beliefs. And this is what he said. The Bible says, first of all, Joseph refused. Joseph itemized why he refused. He said, this is why it was not supposed to be. And then he ended by saying, God does not approve it. It is a sin against God. The Bible says she kept on day after day, but Joseph refused to sleep with her and he kept out of her way as much as possible. If you are going to be that play, in that place of change, principles and things that you believe in as correct, apart from the Bible that you believe in, there are certain things that even normal life does not accept. Don't change the principles, but let the approach to how you do things continue to change. It will change, but let the basic foundational things not change. In fact, even in our world, the fundamentals really do not change. It's improvements that we see. Look, let me give you an example. You take our television. We started with the black and white television. What was the objective of the television? To give image and sound. Two critical things. Image that you can see and sound so you can hear. What has happened? We started with the black and white television. The image was not very was not very clear, so we didn't see any color, but the sound was there. We improved and went to the color television. That has not stopped. We've improved to LCD televisions. We've improved to flat screen television. We've improved now to curved television. The fundamentals have not changed. Image and sound but improvement has come that's how our life is also that as a child of God if you know him as Savior and Lord the fundamental thing of knowing him as Savior and Lord and walking in faith and obedience to God guided by the Bible will guide you through whatever improvement the world brings let them know where you stand when it comes to the things that are happening in this world let them know that you stand on the principles of the Bible that cannot change you stand on the truth of the Bible that stands secure forever. Many have come and gone. Kings have come and gone. Empires have risen and fallen. The Bible still remains. Still remains. The Bible and has not changed. The message is the same. People have criticized it. It has survived. They've tried to burn it. It be ready to change with the things that you see. Let them know your position. Let them know what you believe. Let them get to the point that when they say certain things, they'll say, no, don't talk to this person. This is where they stand. The challenge we have is that we've changed so many things that we want to now use our human wisdom to change what God has written. We will never be as wise as God. We will never know as much as God. We will never be God. God must remain God and sovereign and all-knowing and all-wise. And the all-wise God has 
given us his word to guide us. And when we think we want to change what God has said, even when we don't want to challenge what our leaders have said, challenge what our fathers have said, but we want to challenge and change what God has said, then there will always be a problem. Stand on the principles of truth that you know and walk with God and see him lead you in a new place, in a new direction, in a new job, in a new environment like Joseph did. He found success, but he stood on the principles that he had learnt. If you are going to manage change, you must embrace the new, but be solid on your beliefs. Joseph said, this is sin. This is sin. They may accept it, but this is sin. It may seem right to some, but this is sin. And I won't do that because there are principles that I have. That's tough sometimes, but grace is available to help us. And I want to encourage you that if you've moved from the principles that you know, because certain things you wanted to achieve, go back and ask God, who has promised in his word that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The last thing, which for me is the most wonderful of all, of all that I've said, I think the last that I'm going to share with you is the most wonderful of all. Trust God to bless. Trust God to bless. Trust God to bless. Let's, let's close this together. Look with me in verse 2, what he says. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. The Lord was with Joseph. Joseph got to Egypt in the most, on, in the most unexpected way. He was sold there. He didn't plan to go there. Change was forced upon him, but the Lord was present with him in keeping with his word that yea though you walk to the valley of the shadow of death I will be with you my rod and my staff will comfort you the circumstances may not be good but his presence and power is always assured the circumstances may not be good but his presence and power is always assured but note what he says that he, as he served Joseph was diligent as you trust God be diligent the Bible tells us Paul said that we should not serve out of hypocrisy and eye service but we should do it as unto to God. Joseph served diligently. The Bible says as he served in the home of his Egyptian master, the Lord was with Joseph. Trust God. He will be with you. Yes, that change shocked you. Yes, that change turned your life around. Yes, that change appeared to make things difficult. God is still with you. The next thing we see is in verse 3. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything. Look what he says. Potiphar noticed. Some version says he observed. Some version says he saw. Joseph became a witness for God Almighty. Joseph was diligent in what he did. God was with him. Joseph became a witness in the place where he was for God Almighty that they could pick out and say there's something different about this guy. God is with him. What God? They knew the Hebrew God that he was coming from. Maybe he had told them who he was. We don't know. But they identified that Jehovah Almighty was with Joseph. You need to remain a witness. The circumstances that took you there may not have been good, but be a witness that they will know that God is still with you. You came in in a bad way. Joseph came in as a slave, but God was with him, and God still had planned. Be a witness. Then, in trusting God to bless, God will bless those who are diligent. God will bless those who are his witnesses. Look at verse 5 where it tells us again that God was with Joseph, and look at what he says. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master household and property. The Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All his household affairs ran smoothly. His crops and livestock flourished. Joseph was there and became a source of blessing to others. He became a source of blessing to Potiphar's house. A house where people did not even know or trust God. The presence of Joseph brought blessing upon that home. Why? Joseph was diligent. Joseph was a witness. Joseph became a source of blessing to a house where the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was not glorified. But because there was a witness there who stood to his principles, blessing came upon that home. Oh, may you be a source of blessing to those who are around you. Oh, may 
may you be able to adopt change and not be grumbling and complaining and crying for the things that you can't really change, but adapt to where you are and be a source of blessing to those who are with you to know that there's something about this young man, there's something about this beautiful girl, there's something about this handsome man, there's something about you that makes them come and when they come, there's a blessing that you, you, you release to them because God is with you. Don't be discouraged in the situation you are in. Oh yes, you've lost your loved one. God is still with you. Oh yes, the person who was sponsoring you has passed on. God is still with you. Your life has changed. It's not as easy as it used to be. Yes, God is still with you and would raise people that would make you see that you are still a source of blessing and take care of you. Oh yes, you lost your job. Oh yes, you got into some difficulty. You are facing physical challenges. Challenges. God is still with you. Let your life reflect the power and presence of God. Let your life reflect the glorious power of God Almighty. Trust God to bless you in the new situation that you are in because change has come. Change has come. Joseph, as I close this morning, was able to adapt to the new situation he found himself because he was willing to reinvent and renew himself. Joseph was able to adapt and manage the change that he found himself because he was willing to reinvent and renew himself. But in reinventing and renewing himself, he maintained the principles that he had learned that guide and guide life. He had learned he had trusted God. He had learned that there was a God who took care of his father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather. He knew that there was that God. Somehow he knew it. It had been imparted in his life and it took him through the difficulty. God did not fail Joseph. God will not fail you, but you need to be diligent. You need to reinvent, renew, re unlearn. You need to allow yourself do things that will glorify God. You need to stand on the right principles. You need to be able to practice and make permanent that can bring change, not permanent that keeps you tied down to traditionalism. For those of you who are listening this morning, I end with the saying of the late management guru, as they will say, Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker was the one as we turned into the new millennium and the new century. Peter Drucker was the one that says we have come into the eras of the three C's. The three C's that Peter Drucker said is where accelerated change, overwhelming complexities, and tremendous competition. Let me say that again. That we're in an era of accelerated change, overwhelming complexities, and tremendous competition. That's the time we're living. Things are changing fast. You can't be left behind. If you are left behind, you become obsolete, but you are young. You would have been left behind, and you'll be shocked. What happened? The world is changing very fast. And as it's changing, there are overwhelming complexities. We don't understand certain things because of how things are moving so fast. We don't understand some of those things. But there's a place of understanding that we can always find refuge and peace. Is understanding that God is still in charge of the affairs of men. There are overwhelming complexities and tremendous competition tremendous competition in every sphere of life today the competition is high in every sphere of life the competition is high and they are finding ways every day to weed out certain people improve yourself adapt to the new system hold on to the principles of truth that would guide you and guard you and be able to manage the changes as you go through life but as I close I tell you there's one change that must take place and once that change takes place your life will not remain the same. That is the change that comes when Jesus comes into your life as Lord and Savior. When that change takes place, it gives you joy from within that no one can take away. When that change takes place, it gives you hope in your life that this world is not your home. There's a place coming where in all the changes of life and the competition of life and the complexities of life will end one day. There's a place of eternal rest and glorious joy. That change comes when you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Savior. He doesn't allow you to go alone. He says, I will be with you. His spirit will guide you to help you manage the change that would have come. Because the old would have passed away, the new would have come. Your body will be tied to the old. The spirit will be pulling you to the new. And as you are able to manage that, led by the power of the spirit of God, your life, I assure you, will never remain the same. If you don't know Jesus,
Jesus. Oh, that, that change take place in your life. It's the greatest change that can happen to anybody. That change took place in my life and many who are listening. Some of you have not experienced that change. Let that change take place. And once that change takes place, the Spirit of God will guide you that any other change that comes, because the greatest change has taken place, you'll be able to manage it because God will guide you. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you, O oh Lord, that in this life, changes will occur. But if we've been changed by you, we'll be able to manage any kind of change. Help us as we live this life, O oh Lord. You've made us your children. Help us to be able to adapt to circumstances that come our way that are beyond our control. Help us to learn, unlearn, and relearn. Help us, O oh Heavenly Father, to stand on the principles of truth. Help us eternal our God to trust you, that you will bless. And what we have missed and what we thought has been taken away from us because of the change that has taken place, you would bless us beyond our expectation. Oh God, it may be some who don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. I ask you today, the power to convict and change lies in the great Holy Spirit. Oh, Spirit of the living God, do what man cannot do. Transform lives and glorify yourself. Bring conviction to some. I ask, O Heavenly Father. I pray, O Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I ask you to say this prayer after me. Hail, dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for taking my place in dying. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for giving hope to men and women. Now I come to you, O God, believing that you are Lord and trusting that you are you will save me. Put my trust in you today to be savior of my soul and to be Lord of my life. Thank you, Father, for accepting me. In Jesus' name I pray. If you've prayed that prayer, please, because we don't meet together, find a Bible-believing church. Go there. Tell them what you have done and they'll be able to help you, give you guidance as you walk in the way of Jesus Christ. You can reach out to us and we'll be able to help you. Father, thank you for your word that has gone out. We stand on the promise that you have made that your word would not return to you void. Some children of yours needed this word. They needed it and you've given it to them. Oh God, may they run this life, this journey of faith. May they run with these words powered by your spirit, reminded by your spirit and given strength by your spirit. Thank you, our Father, for today. Thank you for, here, for, for your presence with all of us. The greatness that we enjoy is your presence is with all of us. I pray for my dear young ones. I pray, O oh God, that you give them strength to keep going in this race of life. Help them to be able to manage the changes they will meet in the course of life, guided by the principles that you've given to us in your word. This I pray with thanksgiving in the victorious and glorious name of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you again for tuning in. We'll come your way on Tuesday. And when we come your way on Tuesday, we'll come with Bible study. Like I said, if you want to be a member of our church soon, we'll come back in our place in our Equa, our Sokoro, and our physical uh, meetings will start very soon. It's been a difficult time, I know, for many of you who are members, but don't worry. Very soon, we'll forget what has happened. We need to adapt to the new situation, and God will see us through so that we'll be better. Take care of yourself. Be safe. Please follow the instructions your medical people give you. Stay safe. Wash your hands, please. Be careful with your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. Wash your hands and make sure that all goes well. Thank you. May the Lord bless you.